Welcome back. So today's lesson is going to be on care of patients with cancer. Uh, again, gonna kind of cut to the chase and give you the information that you absolutely need. So uh, at the end of this chapter, what you should be able to do is understand a normal cell, the structures of it, how it functions, and then understand what changes when a cell becomes malignant or cancerous. Um, chemotherapeutic agents, um, how do we take care of patients receiving chemo and or radiation? Uh, what kind of data you need to collect? Oncological emergencies, nursing care, evaluation of nursing interventions, and then a little bit about hospice so that you understand hospice and palliative care. And so this starts out, uh, the first slide, which is slide number four, looks at just a review of the A and P of a normal cell. So the normal cell, all the structures, the plasma membrane, um, the mitochondria, which is the powerhouse, if you remember back from endocrine, that's the part of the cell that makes ATP, adenosine triphosphate, or energy. Um, so, you know, a normal cell has very specific characteristics to it. And depending on what part of the body it comes from, your immune system recognizes that that is your cell. It belongs to you. And so it doesn't attack it as it does in people with, say, autoimmune disorders. Right? But with cancer, there is a change that occurs where the cell still looks like a normal cell to your body, but the functions uh, are changed. They're aberrant. Okay. Um, if you move to slide six, we're going to um, incorporate some words you may or may not know. Neoplasm literally means new growth. So when you hear somebody say, you know, it's neoplastic, usually they're referring to cancer. The word benign means not cancerous or harmless. And the word malignant, and that's the dirty word, it's the big C. Malignancy means that it is cancer. So with the pathophys of cancer, normal cells mutate. And we know that there are things that cause cancer. Those things are called carcinogens. And we know for a fact that certain carcinogens are absolutely cancer-causing agents, but why do some people get cancer and other people don't when they're exposed to maybe the same sets of carcinogens? So that's, that's the million-dollar question. If we could answer that question, we could figure out why this mutation happens, and if we can figure out the why, then we could figure out the cure. Right now, we don't have cure. We have treatment. So a normal cell mutates the genetics of the cell change. And here's the big thing that's really important. Cancer cells start to grow at such a rapid rate of proliferation, unlike normal cells in the body. And I'm going to give you a fun fact. The only cells that we have normally in our bodies that grow at a pretty rapid rate are the cells of our hair, skin, nails, and our digestive tract. So when we administer chemotherapy, chemotherapy specifically is meant to attack these fast proliferating cells. So it's going to attack the cancer, but it's going to attack the hair, the skin, the nails, and the GI tract. That's why people on chemo lose their hair, become nauseous. They sometimes get like a rosacea or some skin lesions. It's because the chemo is attacking that as well. Okay. So that's important to know. Well, what is a carcinogen? Let's talk about that. There are some things, like I said, we know for a fact they are carcinogenic. They cause cancer. Red meat. You heard me. Red meat. And especially lamb. I don't even eat lamb anymore. Um, but lamb, because of the, the diet that they're fed, they tend to be more of a carcinogen than other meats. But red meats in general are considered carcinogenic. Processed foods, because what you're eating is a chemical cocktail, really. So things that come in cans and bags um, are definitely bad for you. Guess what? Cigarettes are bad for you. Mm. Who knew? I never knew. See, mine have vitamins in them. But anyway, cigarette smoke. Firsthand cigarette smoke. In other words, if you are a smoker, secondhand cigarette smoke. If you live with or are exposed to the smoke of a smoker. Believe it or not, overcooked or burned foods. When you say, I want my steak well done and I want that bacon crispy, you know that crispy, delicious part? Carcinogen. 
Sorry, bad news. There are many, many chemicals that we are exposed to that are potentially cancer causing. Believe it or not, talc or talcum, which is, well, not anymore, but used to be in baby powder and different types of body powders, carcinogenic has been linked to ovarian cancer. Certain pollutants we know are carcinogenic. The sun, which we need, got to have sunshine, right? We need it to live. But overexposure to the ultraviolet light that the sun gives us so can cause skin cancer. And really, the factor there is a sunburn. Statistically speaking, people that have been burned, a blistering sunburn at least once, are immediately exponentially a higher risk for skin cancer than someone who's never had a burn. Radiation, the thing that we use to shrink tumors for people with cancer, causes cancer. Anybody who's ever gone to the dentist and had x-rays done, you know, what do they do? They put this lead apron on you and they run out of the room quick and they're like, click, click with the button to take the x-ray. Why do they do that? Well, because they're taking x-rays all day long and they don't want to be exposed to that radiation over and over again. For you, it's a little bit of radiation, right? For them, they're doing it all day. And so that we know because that, that level of exposure, if they were staying in that room all day long, taking x-rays on every patient that came in, they then would be a risk for cancer. Hormones. Hormones, especially estrogen. So when we talk about the female reproductive cancers, in other words, cervical cancer, uterine cancer, ovarian cancer, vulvular cancer, breast cancer, in the female, many of those cancers, not every single one, but many of them are fed or fueled by estrogen. And so one of the treatments, believe it or not, is either an estrogen blocker, so to deprive them of the estrogen, or we can actually give male hormones to kind of counteract the estrogen, meaning testosterone. So those are carcinogens. And then what are risk factors? Well, this one's tough, okay? We, we believe that certain oncoviruses, so certain viruses, radiation we know, certain chemicals we know, certain irritants that we are exposed to. Um, genetics is probably one of the biggest ones. And you'll notice that on slide nine, genetics I have highlighted in yellow with lots of asterisks behind it. The reason being is that risk factors like radiation exposure and chemical exposure and secondhand or firsthand smoke, those are things that we can avoid but we cannot avoid our genetics. So if cancer runs in your family, it's not a guarantee that you'll get it, but it certainly exponentially increases your risk, okay? Because it runs in families. And again, why? Mm, don't know. Diet, hormones, and certain immune factors when we talk about certain cancers. So um, those are the risk factors for cancer. Uh, page 10 has some statistics on it. They change all the time. But when we talk about cancer, I want you to be familiar with the words. So carcinoma, hear the oma. Sarcoma, hear the oma. Lymphoma, melanoma. When you see oma, don't think grandma, think cancer. Okay. And then leukemia, which is a cancer of the blood, a blood dyscrasia. Um, I've included a couple slide pictures so you can kind of get a look at what cancer looks like. So the slide 12 is an adenocarcinoma of the cecum. In other words, the cecum is part of the large intestine that's right next to the appendix. Okay. Little tiny little kind of tail right next to the appendix. Slide 13 is a really nice MRI shot of cancer of the lung. And then you're going to love slide 14, malignant melanoma. When it comes to cancer of the skin, there are three different types of skin cancer. So you've got basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and then malignant melanoma. Now, don't misconstrue. All three of those are cancerous. They are cancer. However, basal cell and squamous cell carcinomas are, for cancer, slow growing right? 
very unusual for those types of cancers. And if they're found, they are easily removed. But a malignant melanoma, just like most other forms of cancer, is quick growing. So it starts on the skin, but it metastasizes throughout the body. So malignant melanoma will kill you. And there's a picture of a plantar aspect of a patient's foot. In other words, the sole of their foot. That's right the middle of the ball of the foot. And that is the melanoma that's metastasized and it's eating its way through the skin. There's a picture of uh, a gentleman, his chest, and you can see all the lesions, metastatic malignant melanoma. And then this is important when it comes to client education for skin cancer. If you have a mole that is brand new, that never was there before, that has changed size or shape, usually they're irregularly shaped. They're not round. They're kind of weird shaped, elliptical and stuff like that. If it has ridges, uneven borders, if it's pretty colors, those are cancer. So you need to get the dermatologist right away so that it's diagnosed. And when we talk about metastasis, you know, what does the word mean? The word means invasion of. And so when we say metastatic disease or metastatic cancer, that means the cancer is now not in situ. That means where it started, okay? Not in situ, but it's elsewhere. In other words, it's gone outside its point of origin and it's invading other areas and it can invade the blood lymph vessels, lymph nodes, lymph tissues, and it will lodge and grow in these new locations. So make sure you're familiar with the term. So you know metastasis means growth or invasion, right? And when we say, you know, in situ, um, in situ, and I'm going to put that in here, in situ means the site of origin. And when it's metastatic, it's no longer in the site of origin, okay? Metastatic disease is outside this site. Okay. All righty. Um, let's move along. I have another lovely picture. I know that you're looking forward to the pictures. Uh, metastasis to the skin, but not from skin cancer. So this is a photograph of breast cancer that has actually metastasized through the chest wall. And you can see it's basically, it looks necrotic, right? You see the areas that are black and thick and yellow and they look hard. That's, that's necrosis because the cancer cells don't function like normal cells. And because they don't function like normal cells, they don't make ATP. They don't um, function in a way that allows them to get oxygen, make energy, all the things that normal cells do. And so that area will eventually just be eaten away. Okay? Okay. Most common cancers, just FYI, for men, it's prostate, lung, colon, and for women, it's breast, lung, colon. See the common denominator? Lung cancer, colon cancer, they're the biggies. And then reproductive. For men, it's the prostate. And for women, it's the breast, right? And I'm telling you, and I can't say this enough, with cancer, with any disease that we spoke of or any disease that exists, prevention, prevention, prevention is the key because it's so much easier to try to prevent than it is to try to treat. And it's also easier if it's detected early. There is, <clears throat> excuse me, nothing more frustrating than hearing someone say something like, Oh, I don't want to go to the doctor. What I don't know won't hurt me. Well, that's not true. What you don't know will kill you. So early detection, regular screening. For women, it's self-breast examination. It's regular mammograms. For, uh, you know, for women, also genetic testing. And I will tell you about um, one particular test, which is the BRAC test. And it is a genetic test. It's a blood test that can tell you if you are predisposed, in other words, if you have the genetics that will predispose you to probably, not possibly, probably getting breast cancer. So if that BRAC test comes back positive, you're going to get breast cancer more than likely. The question is not if, it's when. I use Angelina Jolie 
as an example. So Angelina Jolie, and you should all know who she is. So she had the BRAC test done. There are some other genetic assays that can be done as well. And she found out that she would probably get breast cancer and ovarian cancer. So she decided to be proactive and preemptive. And she had a bilateral mastectomy. In other words, both breasts removed. And she had a hysterectomy. So when we talk about a hysterectomy, a total hysterectomy means that they're taking everything reproductive. In other words, the cervix, the uterus, the fallopian tubes, and the ovaries. Shops closed. Everybody's fired. Non-essential workers get out. And we're taking everything out. So that's what she had done. Because she was of the frame of mind that she'd already had children. Well, she had children. She grabbed a couple more, grabbed a couple more. She got a boatload of kids. And she, she knew that the risk was higher than the benefit. So she, you know, had the bilateral mastectomy. And then she went and got new, better boobies afterwards that were like, like brand new 19-year-old boobies. Um, and the hysterectomy so that she would not even be at the risk anymore because you remove the organs, you remove the risk. So how do we diagnose cancer? Biopsy. So you, you've heard the word biopsy before. Biopsy is where we have to actually take a bit of the tissue that we suspect is cancerous and remove that bit of tissue, send it to the lab and have the lab look at it. I mean, theoretically, when you get a pap smear, Every, every year or every two to three years, depending on your age and your risk factors, et cetera. What are they doing? They're scraping cervical cells from your cervix. It's a biopsy of sorts, sending them to the lab and looking at them under the microscope to see if they're normal cells or if they are atypical. In other words, and atypical cells are considered possibly precancer cells, right? Radiological studies, in other words, we're looking with x-ray, right? We're looking with um, a PET scan. Nuclear imaging, ultrasounds, MRIs, endoscopy, bronchoscopy, cystoscopy, colonoscopy, everyoscopy, right? We're going to go in and look. Lab testing like the BRAC that I spoke about. Um, there, there are others. PSA, prostatic specific antigen. The PSA is a test that uh, determines prostate cancer in men. And then cytological study means that we've taken some of the tissue or cells and sent them to the lab to be looked at under the microscope. So when we do biopsies, biopsies can be done by aspiration. In other words, we can take a needle and go into where the, the, the gathering or cluster of cells is. We can call that a lesion. We can call it a questionable tumor. We can call it a mass. All those words mean there's a growth there that wasn't there before, and we don't know what it is. So if you hear lesion or mass or growth, those words mean, I don't know if it's a cyst or if it's a tumor. Is it benign? Is it malignant? We need to find out. So we can do a fine needle biopsy where we go in with a needle and aspirate some of the cells, send them to the lab. Um, don't worry about a stereotactic biopsy. Mammogram, everybody should be having those. Okay. And they are critical for women. So prevention, prevention, prevention. If, in fact, cancer is found, cancer is graded and staged. Okay. When we talk about staging, I will explain staging briefly. I don't want to get into too much detail. But cancer is staged um, zero through four. So if we talk about stages zero through three, Zero through three means that, yes, there's cancer, but it's still where it started. It's still in sight two, right? So it's still where it started. When you hear stage four, okay, the brain should go, metastasis. Stage four means it's metastatic disease. And that means that it has already now moved and invaded someplace else in the body. That's not good. Okay. Not good. Um, so just make sure that you understand the stages. I'm not going to get into the grading. Okay. And then what do we do? Well, if it's isolated, you know, like lung cancer, there is non-small cell carcinoma and there's small cell carcinoma or oat cell it's called. So small cell carcinoma is diffuse. 
it's kind of all over the place. It's you can't just go in and remove it. Whereas, you know, non-small cell usually starts out as a mass, a tumor that we can go in and we can cut it out. So sometimes surgery, sometimes radiation therapy, chemotherapy, and chemotherapy means medications to treat cancer. That's what the word means, chemo, chemical, medications. So chemotherapy um, is sometimes used alone, sometimes used with radiation therapy. It depends on the cancer, the stage of the cancer, you know, where is it, et cetera, et cetera. So, and with radiation and chemotherapy, there come just so many side effects, so many adverse effects for people. Um, it's, it's very, very difficult to um, watch in, in some instances. Um, and we're going to talk about radiation, internal and external, and you'll know what that means in a minute. And we'll talk about chemo and make sure you know methotrexate. You know, I'm even putting that here uh, so this way you do not forget it because methotrexate, oh, the Board of Nursing, the Board of Nursing and ATI, they love to ask you about methotrexate. Trust me when I tell you. And that's one of your meds, so you should know it. All right, radiation, with, with external or internal radiation. We are basically using radioactive waves to shrink a tumor, okay? And it, it can either be external, in other words, where the patient goes into a facility and they will be in front of a machine and the machine is kind of like a gun and the gun has a very specific target and it will, will, will target the tumor and just hit it with radiation, radioactive waves, to shrink it. Because radioactivity kills things. Okay? But the side effects, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, anorexia, which is loss of appetite, mucositis, in other words, inflammation of the mucous membranes, xerostomia. If you don't know what that is, you should. That's dry mouth, right? Dry mouth. But to the, like, nth degree. Uh, skin reactions, believe it or not, radiation therapy, external radiation therapy um, can burn the skin almost like a sunburn, blistering, burning because it's hot. Okay. And then the last thing you need to know about is bone marrow depression, myelosuppressive qualities. Um, and myelosuppression or bone marrow depression means the radiation, even though it's specific, it has general side effects and it depresses the bone marrow, which depresses the bone marrow's ability to do what? Make blood cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So patients that are receiving radiation are anemic, neutropenic, and thrombocytopenic. So in other words, low red blood cells, hemoglobin hematocrit, low white blood cells, and low platelets or thrombocytes. So they will be anemic, they will be neutropenic, risk for infection, they will be um, thrombocytopenic, risk for bleeding, things that you need to know. When we talk about radiation safety, uh, I'm gonna add a couple things in here just so that you understand. With external radiation, external radiation is, um, I don't even wanna call it, less troublesome, but a little bit it kind of is because the patient himself or herself is not radioactive. In other words, they go into a facility, we hit them with radiation. They usually go for several treatments until we get our desired outcome. In other words, if the tumor is this big, now the tumor is this big, okay? But with internal radiation, let me explain. So there are some cancers, and I'm going to use prostate as uh, an example. So prostate cancer, there is something called radioactive seeds or radioactive implant. And basically what they do is the physician will take radioactive material and will actually surgically implant it into the patient. So with prostate cancer, they'll take these radioactive seeds. They're not really seeds, but they're bits of radioactive material that are actively radioactive and they'll insert them inside the patient. The patient now is radioactive, okay? So in other words, the patient is emitting radioactive waves from his or her body. 
and anything that comes out of them, in other words, urine, feces, blood, vomit, sweat, everything that comes out of the patient is radioactive too. What is the only, only substance that can block radioactive waves? TikTok. Don't know? Lead. Make sure you know that. Lead is the only substance that can absolutely block radioactivity. And so, again, back to the dentist and the lead apron, right? The reason they put that lead apron on you is because they don't want to keep hitting you with radiation in your reproductive areas and around your lungs and your heart and your organs, right? Because the lead blocks the radiation. So, when a patient is receiving internal radiation, they will be in an isolation room by themselves. They will have a lead container. You heard me right. So for anything that needs to be removed from that room, it needs to be placed in the lead container before it's taken out of the room because it's radioactive as well. Nursing staff, pregnant nurses, so that patient that has internal radiation may not have children visit at all, may not have pregnant women visit at all, pregnant nurses, because they're radioactive. And the picture there kind of gives a good representation so you can visualize. Patient's in the bed, and you see the radioactive waves that are being emitted from him. And then you see the distance of the nurse. The closer the nurse gets to the patient, the higher the level of radioactive waves she's being exposed to. Um, they will even give nurses that work on the oncology unit something called a dosimeter, D-O-C-I-M-E-T-E-R. <clears throat> I don't care for them, and I'll tell you why, because they kind of lull you into a false sense of security. Because here's the million-dollar question. How much radiation exposure is too much? Huh? And that's really the answer. We don't know. We don't know exactly how much is too much. So in other words, the, the dosimeters, all right, you've been exposed to this much radiation for five minutes. Am I getting cancer? Yes or no? I don't know. So you see my point. So the point is, is that the limitation of time spent in this patient's room is critical. And anything in the room, for example, he's a male, he's got a urinal, he urinates in the urinal. You don't touch that. You use tongs, right? Lead, you can't touch anything, not with gloves. It's not going to block radiation. Make sure you understand all of that. Those are ATI questions and board questions they love to ask about internal radiation. Okay? All right. Next, let's talk about chemotherapy. And again, chemotherapy is just medication that is used to kill the cancer. And with chemotherapy, usually it is IV. Um, its real motive is to kill fast-growing cells, right? Because quick growth, rapid proliferation is the hallmark of cancer cells. Um, and usually it is a cocktail. So it's usually given IV and it's usually a cocktail. Now, there, there are oral chemos, but typically you will see the patient have an implanted port also called a portacath, also called a mediport. In other words, something implanted in their chest that goes right to the superior vena cava, the right atrium of the heart, where we can go in with a Huber needle and infuse medication so it's going right into a big, big vein, the vena cava. And a mediport, portacath, by the way, how long can someone have one of those in? Indefinitely. 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, truly. So um, they usually use that Mediport, and it's usually more than one drug, usually a cocktail. But when we talk about the side effects of chemotherapy, well, bone marrow depression. So in other words, leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, anemia, we talked about that, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, stomatitis, inflammation of the mouth that can be very painful, very painful, right? And hair loss, you should know alopecia is hair loss. Um, I will tell you this. I know ATI likes to ask about, and the Board of Nursing does too. Patient knows that they're scheduled to start their chemotherapy. What do they do about getting a wig? Well, they should get fitted for the wig before they start chemo. 
because after chemo, it changes what your hair will grow back looking like. So if you want hair that looks like your hair, you want to get fitted for the wig before chemo. And during chemo, they will give you what's called a cold cap. So a cold cap. You know, for some people when they swim, swimmers wear those swim caps real tight on their heads. A cold cap looks like that, except it's cold. And the idea is, is that, think about it. If something is very, very cold, cold slows things down, okay? So we're going to slow down the cell activity of the hair, and so they won't lose their hair as quickly with a cold cap. You're welcome. That's a board question. Make sure you know that. Uh, reproduction is affected by chemo and by radiation. So I will tell you this for younger people of childbearing age that have cancer that need to have chemo. Um, what we will do is uh, we will have them, if it's a female, we can harvest eggs from their ovaries and we can cryo freeze them for later use. If it's a male, we can do the same thing with sperm. So we can, you know, get sperm and freeze it for later because the chances are, as far as long-term effects of chemo, they may not be able to reproduce, right? So the, the chemotherapy and radiation also will make the patient infertile. They will be unable to bear children. So that's important to know as a long-term side effect of chemo and radiation, okay? And neurotoxicity. I mean, I hate to say this, but chemotherapy, it's kind of like poison, you know? And not like BBD poison. Poison. It's poison to the system. Toxic, right? Um, back in the day when I did home care, right after I left the hospital, we used to administer fluorocell 5. 5-FU, which is a chemo for colon cancer in people's homes. And I'm telling you that they gave me like a NASA suit to put on, not a lie, and the like these really special gloves to wear because it's toxic. So understand that, you know, the chemotherapy does carry with it many, many, many side effects that, that can be very bad. But again, do I want to die from cancer? Or do I want to be bald and vomiting? Well, bald and vomiting is better than dying from cancer, okay? Um, when we talk about terms with IV, there's something called extravasation, and there's a really good picture on slide 29. Extravasation, extra, outside, vasation, the vessel. What that means is, is that what we're putting in, and in this case, it's chemotherapy that we have been infusing in this man's port, Instead of going in the port, something happened. The needle moved. I mean, who's to say? But something happened where we were putting the chemo in. And it wasn't going into the port or the vein, going around in the tissue. And look what it did, right? So that is a really bad case of extra vessation. When we talk about um, the problems, there's a little acronym that you can use. It's called BITES, cancer BITES. So bleeding infection, tiredness, emesis, and skin changes. And that does help some people remember what the effects are, the negative effects of chemo and radiation. Okay? So bites. Now, real quickly, we'll talk about colony stimulating factors, but you should already know these. Granulocyte colony stimulating factor. Erythropoietin. Just think about it. When we talk about colony stimulating factors, we need to address the fact that the patient is going to be so leukopenic, okay? And so for leukopenia, what do we do? We would give them filgrastin, which is neupogen, neulasta, right? Something to stimulate the production of white blood cells. So for granulocyte, granulocyte you know, white blood cell production. So for white blood cell production, that's filgrastin. And erythropoietin, red blood cell production. You should know this one, right? What is it? Epoetin alpha, right? Everybody knows that because those are the drugs I made you look up, right? Don't worry about interleukin too, but there are medications that are colony stimulating factors for thrombocytes as well that will stimulate the production of platelets, okay? All right, next slide talks about nursing diagnoses that go along with it. Um, we will talk about um, hospice care. I'm gonna jump ahead to slide 34. 
So hospice care is basically, it's end of life care. That's palliation. We take care of symptoms. We provide comfort measures only. Patient has to have a prognosis of less than six months. Hospice can be inpatient, in other words, in a facility. It can be outpatient, in other words, it could be at their home. There's always a team. I ran a hospice for three years. Um, we've got same thing, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech and language pathology. We have nurses, RNs and LPNs. We've had chaplains. We have massage therapy, music therapy, animal therapy. And so basically we are treating the whole patient and providing them with as much comfort and pain management as is possible in those last six months of their life, okay? Don't confuse palliative care with hospice care. So in other words, all hospice care is palliative. So in other words, we're only treating symptoms. But all palliative is not hospice because with palliative care, we'll do surgery. Hospice care, no. They won't do palliation with surgery or with chemo. So hospice will not do surgical procedures. They will treat you with medications like morphine or fentanyl, even methadone, believe it or not. Um, so there you go. Um, one of the medications that I do want to make sure that you don't forget when it comes to secretions, um, dying patients tend to have something called the death rattle. And the death rattle is this... This gurgling sound. Uh, so remember, with the death rattle, that gurgling sound, it is secretions that are built up. And so for for the for the death rattle, and I'm just going to type that in here. For the death rattle, the treatment is atropine ophthalmic drops. You heard me right. We use atropine, which is a cardiac med. It's an anticholinergic medication, and you need to know it. But we use the ophthalmic drops, the eye drops, and we put them in the patient's mouth. It dries the secretions and it minimizes that, that death rattle. Make sure you know that board of nursing. I'm even going to put a bunch of stars after it so that you know that that's important. Okay. All right. Oncological emergencies, lots of things can happen. I'm not even going to get into great detail about that, but, um, when the things that I've spoken about here, and I've left out a good bit, but I've focused on the things that you need to know. Um, if you have any questions, you know where to find me. And so that's the end of cancer. Peace out, guys.